Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Take your Bibles and go to the book of Jude, if you would, please. I really wrestled on this particular message, on completing the message that I had really started last week. But at the same time, we know at this time of year, Jesus Christ came to save his people from their sins. And the book of Jude is really talking about those that would distort the gospel message, the good news. In fact, in verse 3, as you know, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. I draw our attention once again to verses 22 and 23. It says, And if some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Last Sunday morning, we really drew the attention about how that we need to be compassionate as we seek to win the lost for Christ. We come to this particular portion of the scripture, though, in verse 23, that ought to be a concern for each and every one of us And there's two prongs to this particular part of the message when we think of pulling them out of the fire. And the the primary interpretation there, of course, is in regards to those who might be influenced by false teachers, that they would embrace a work salvation, a distorted view of the gospel of grace. And also for those who are believers, that are not walking in fellowship with the Lord. And there is that aspect of life where some are driven by the love of God to make decisions for Christ, but there are also those who are really because of the fear of God and the fear of hell that make one really draw their attention to eternity as well as their condition. And ultimately, if they don't accept Christ, the awfulness of a place called hell. I've talked to many people who say that they heard a lot of messages, but then when someone preached on the subject of hell, it really made them sit up and take notice. In fact, that's my own testimony. As you know, I've heard many messages as I was going to Sunday school and church as my mom had gotten saved first, and we started going to the Southgate Baptist Church there in Augusta, Georgia. And then as a boy, I heard a lot of messages on salvation uh, in Sunday school, the pulpit ministry. But it wasn't until I was 15 years of age in an auditorium of about over 9,000 people sitting up in the balcony where the preacher got up and he preached on the subject of hell. And it was like God the Holy Spirit came to me and said, Mike, if you don't swallow your pride and get saved, That's exactly where you're going to end up. And that's when I decided at that time that I was going to trust Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And my life has not been the same since. And so there are some who are drawn by the preaching on the love of God. There are also those who are drawn to the Savior because of the judgment of God. And we find here that it says that there are some that will need to be saved with that aspect of fear and that word pulling them out of the fire. If you really look that word up, pulling it, it's an action word to be sure, but it talks about where you see someone that's just about ready to fall over and you grab them and you pull them out of the fire. You pull them out of harm's way. And of course, we know that Jude is writing to Christians. He's writing to this early church saying, look, You need to be aware that there are false teachers out there preaching another gospel. Why are we doing what we're doing tonight with giving the cantata? It's because of eternity. It's because there's a heaven and because also there's a hell. And we want people to go to heaven, amen? We don't want people to go to hell. And that's why Jesus Christ came. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have 
everlasting life. If you go to the book of Genesis in chapter six, I'll just get right to the reading of this particular portion of scripture. In verse five, it says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. This is verse five. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I've made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace, but the rest found judgment. They had 120 years with this preacher of righteousness. The Bible calls him in the New Testament, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He preached about the coming Messiah. He preached about him coming and being a man and making that supreme sacrifice. And all the Old Testament sacrifices pointed, especially that lamb, pointed to the redemption of mankind in Jesus Christ. How that he was a lamb without spot, without blemish. Our Savior was perfect. And so he could meet the just demands of a holy and righteous God. Why? Why did Jesus leave the splendor of heaven? Why did he come and be born in a stable, laid in a feed trough? Why did he go through all that he went through? He did that because he does not want to see one single soul in hell. Because hell was made for the devil and his angels, never made for mankind. But man in his pride and his obstinacy says, you know, I'm not going to listen to God. I'm not going to believe him. I want to go my own way. I want to do my own thing. I want to have my own heaven. And yet Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you take your Bibles and go to the book of Luke, we have probably one of the most graphic accounts of this subject on hell. In Luke chapter 16, in verse 19. Some people would like to relegate this to a parable. I believe this is an actual account. And I believe it says these words in verse 19 and following of Luke chapter 16. And I want us to read this and get the full import if we can. God help us. Why we do what we do. It's because there is a hell. And it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter how close we are to someone. They must have that personal relationship with God. They must have that personal faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their only hope of eternal salvation. Believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And how distorted it is today. How distorted it is at this time of year. But here's what the Bible says, and this is Jesus speaking, by the way. Of course, we know that it's his word. But here when he, in his earthly ministry, was instructing those around him, he, had, he said these words right here. He said, there was a certain rich man which clo was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. A pretty sorry state, I would say, that Lazarus was in. No one would look at him with esteem. No one would say, I want to be like Lazarus. And yet, Lazarus had a great hope within him. And folks, it doesn't matter who you are. Don't, it doesn't matter how hard life is. It doesn't matter how people look at you. The fact of the matter is, if you have Jesus in your heart, he's enough. He's enough. And it says here in verse 22, and it came to pass <clears throat> that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. 
In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, the scripture says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. So we know that there is an appointment that we have to make one day. It's called our death day. We don't really know when that time's going to be. Even when we have been given the sentence of death, we don't know exactly when that time's to be. And we find that the rich man, he died. We find that Lazarus, he died as well. And the Bible says that the rich man went to hell and Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. You have to understand before the crucifixion, there's a place called paradise. And that's where it says in Colossians that he led captivity captive. He went into the lower parts of the earth and led those saints, those Old Testament saints to glory. And we find that then hell has enlarged herself. And we find though at this particular time that the rich man, he's in hell and Lazarus is in paradise. And we find as we continue our reading, he says, and he says, uh, and it came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, verse 23, and in hell he lift up his eyes. So it's not a figment of someone's imagination. It's not just a state of being. Hell is a real place. Heaven is a real place. And Jesus, my friend, spoke more on the subject of hell than he did heaven. And that ought to be a lesson for us as well. It says, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. I can't imagine what that must feel like. Have you ever been burned? Have you ever just touched a hot stove or a hot piece of metal just for a little bit, how it hurt? How you drew back from it? Can you imagine your entire body enveloped and it would never cease to be. It would be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And this man was in torments. The Bible many times says, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Think about the sinful desires of man and how man seeks to satisfy those today. Can you imagine in hell when those desires are at their peak, at their zenith, but can never be satisfied? And how that, that feeling that grips them and then at the same time, the torment of the flame of eternal damnation forever and ever. And on top of that, you have separation from God. We don't really realize the influence of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives today. Thessalonians tells us that when he's taken out of the way, I mean, then you talk about sin running rampant. I mean, right now the Holy Spirit of God is keeping things in check. But when the rapture takes place and we're taken out, look out. You don't want to be here during that time. And so it's so important for us to understand the reality of heaven as well as the reality of hell and hell's not going to be a place where you sit down with your buddies and have a conversation and have a big old party. It's a place of torment. And this man realized that and he's in the midst of that torment and he is able because even if the, the gulf that's fixed there in paradise, between paradise and hell, you see uh, Lazarus and Abraham's bosom and you see the rich man crying out to Father Abraham, crying out to God. He says, can you send Lazarus just to give me a little bit of reprieve? Just a little drop of water. Just the tip on the finger to cool my tongue. For I'm tormented in this flame. He goes on to say in verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. That's why it says you can't serve two masters. 
And the world is trying to find fulfillment and satisfaction only in this life. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Let's just party down. Let's have us a great time. Lazarus, he suffered a lot in this life. But he's been enjoying the blessings of heaven since he died. And the rich man for these 2,000 plus years has been in torments in a place called hell. And God says he didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. That's the whole purpose. That's why we preach. That's why we go out and spread the gospel message. That's why we have cantatas. Because we want people to not go to hell, but to go to heaven where they don't have to go and have that place of torment forever and ever and ever. Verse 26 says, and beside all this, between us and you there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Notice they cannot. Many times the Bible says they would not, because it's a choice. But people are making a choice in this life. And once that choice is made and eternity dawns on them, it's too late. They cannot, they cannot, they cannot ever experience a reprieve. They cannot ever go to heaven once they've said no to the Savior and this life leaves them. Pretty serious. It says here in verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. He says, If I can't be delivered, please send Lazarus to my brother's, my father's house. Look what he continues to say, For I have five brethren, five brothers, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. What's he saying? He says, they've got the word of God. They've got their Bibles. Now you begin to see a little bit of the importance of the word of God. He says, send somebody, send somebody. And God says, they have Moses, they have the prophets, they have the Old Testament. Moses, the writer of the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the prophets. says they've got the word of God, and it's the word of God. The Old Testament even spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis 3.15, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and on and on we can go. And so many of the accounts pointed to Jesus Christ. He says, let them hear them. That's why we preach. That's why we give out the gospel in song and in drama presentations so that people would hear the word of God. He says, and he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. How many times have we said, boy, if I could just see a miracle, if I could just witness this and a, God would just come down and say, no, that, that's not the answer. The answer is, listen to what God has said. Amen. Believe the word of God. He's chosen to magnify his word above his name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you've got to do it in this life. And that's the message that we have to give to a lost and dying world. And there's a lot of false teachers out there that, as I said earlier, they distort the gospel message. They take it out of focus. They muddy up the waters. They add to it. They take away from it. And we who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we have that hope within us. We have that hope in our laps. The world needs this. The world needs the word of God. 
And for some, we need to put our arms around them and say, God loves you. You need to be saved. And yes, for some, God may give us tears to course down our cheeks and give us a heart that beats compassionately for them. But then there are others who need to hear the message. Oh, you need to, you need to pay attention because judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Your sin will, will condemn you to hell. You'll be eternally separated from God forever and ever and ever and ever. You need to pay attention. I don't want to see you in hell. I don't want you to experience the torment. I don't want to see you experience separation from God forever. I don't know that we know the full import of what Jesus was saying on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Can you imagine God turning his back to his only son? Because he who knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus Christ died in your place and in my place. And we have that truth. We're saved. We don't have to worry about torment. We don't have to worry about the fires of hell. But not everyone has that hope. Not everyone has that knowledge. And just as someone gave us the gospel, we ought to be giving others the gospel as well. Look at our text. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. We're living in the last days. It's on everybody's lips these days. We're living in the end times. And if you study Bible prophecy and it hasn't made you more conscious of your need to give out the gospel, something's wrong. And we have a lot of people that they know all the events of what's supposed to take place. They can dissect the book of Revelation. They can read into all the circumstances that are going on in the world and yet it doesn't make a difference in seeking to win people for Christ. Something's wrong with that. And that's what Jude is saying here. He's saying, folks, whatever it takes, if you have to reach some by giving them the love of God, give them the love of God. But if you have to reach others by telling them about the judgment of God, tell them about the judgment of God. And how you and I ought to be concerned as believers, even hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. In other words, anytime someone gets sucked in to false teaching, it dirties and defiles their lives. And it ought to be concerned for every single one of us if we see someone getting sucked into a false belief system. It's interesting that before the book of Revelation, we have the book of Jude. Some making a difference. You and I need to understand that import. The import of a place called heaven and a place called hell. In Luke chapter 15, one chapter over from the account of the rich man Lazarus, I want to close out with just an admonition to those who are not walking with God. Jude is not scolding anybody in these 25 verses of Scripture. Several times in this book we see the word beloved. Beloved, beloved. God gives us a warning because he loves us. And of course, this particular passage in Luke chapter 15 doesn't mean that you as an unsaved person 
excuse me, as a saved person, it doesn't mean that as a saved person that you're going to have to be worried about a place called hell. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. If you're a child of God not walking with God, you will be chastened. That's one of the assurances that you're a believer, is that when you do wrong, you get chastened. If you can do wrong and get away with it, time and time again, and you can go your own way, do your own thing, you're not saved. You need to get saved. Oh, who are you to say that to me? The Word of God says that. You see, in God's economy, the great white throne judgment mentioned in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, that is the judgment of the unsaved. The believer faces another judgment, and that is what we referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That is the judgment of, called the judgment seat of Christ. That's a judgment for reward. So there's two judgments for the unsaved, the great white throne that will actually condemn someone to a place called hell because of the rejection of Jesus Christ. But as a saved person, you're saved. You're on your way to heaven. But now you're part of the family of God. And so God says, I will discipline my children as they get out of line. And that's why it says in the book of Proverbs that if you love your child, you will discipline your child. Think about that believer. Do you find yourself as in the spot of the prodigal? Look what it says here in verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. That's why, you know, when you talk to people who go off and do their own thing and walk away from God and they backslide, you know, at first when they say, oh, it's just great. I'm having a great time. This is fantastic. Never been better. You know, that kind of stuff. And that's exactly what happened here. The guy had a pocket full of money and he went out and he had all kinds of friends. He partied down. I mean, he was just riotous living. Just eat, drink, and be merry all the time. He is living life to the fullest. And notice it says, though, that there came an end to it all. And dear Christian, they'll come an end to it. I don't know when it will be. The Bible doesn't tell us. For some, he lets it go for quite a while. That's the grace of God, giving you an opportunity to get right and to repent. Others, he says, you know, I think I'll just take you on to glory. But he, he works with us. It's called grace. He says here, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, which would be the ultimate of insults for the Jew. And he says, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he, had come to, when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And in one sense, you see him getting right with God right here. And then it says, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now notice his love was constant. His love was sure. God's love for you, dear Christian, outside the will of God for your life. He loves you. He hasn't stopped loving you because you've walked away from him, because you've gone on this sin. He loves you all the more. 
And you notice here though, as soon as he saw his, his son heading his way, he ran to meet him. But it's very interesting. He did not start giving him the benefits of the righteous life again until he heard the words of repentance. Notice what it says here. He came, fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, the father was right there. The father embraced him. He loved him regardless. But notice what he says here. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. How could he do this? Did he do it just because his son showed up at the door? No. But once his son said, I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me as one of your servants. In other words, he's saying, I repent. I'm sorry I did this. Please forgive me, dad. And it says here, and put on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. He restored him to full fellowship. Yes, he paid a price. There were things he lost. He'd spent his inheritance in riotous living. There were some consequences to his sin, but he was in right standing with his father. He was welcomed back into the family. And he says these words, and he says, the best robe, and put it on, and the ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. We have a wonderful God. When you look at the book of Jude, and some have compassion and others say, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You see here that we need to be those who earnestly contend for the faith, who stand upon the truth of the word of God, sending out the gospel message, keeping it pure and plain, and also helping those, brothers and sisters in Christ, that mess up, that sin. And the experience through us, the grace of God as we minister to them, as it says in Galatians chapter six and verse one, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What an opportunity we have in these end times to give out that glorious message, to help those who are lost come to the Savior. That's what we're praying for from tonight. That's why all the work back behind the scenes, I mean, those working the drama have been working at this for weeks. I think they were here yesterday at two in the afternoon. The choir, spending months. Why? Maybe one soul. for the glory of God so that they don't come to that awful place of torment. And who knows what, what saint may walk through the doors, sit down in these chairs and hear good gospel singing, lifting up the Savior and say, you know, my heart burns. I want to be back in fellowship with my Father. I want to come back to my father and just maybe some wayward soul will be brought back into sweet fellowship with the father. And we have a part in that. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please.